Bible stories were a big part of my growing up. The dramatic tales of Moses parting the Red Sea and coming down from the mountain and Jesus routing the money changers in the temple and the whole fantastic narrative still live loudly in my DNA. I took the required courses in the Old and New Testaments at the evangelical college I attended, perhaps the most rigorous classes I've ever taken. But by that time, I was moving away from religious dogma and discovering that the universe of the secular, a pejorative word to Baptists, was infinitely more attractive. But the Bible stories still resonate. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil was placed in the Garden of Eden by God as the one thing forbidden to Adam and Eve. Even as a child, I felt like the game was rigged. We're taught that we are created human and therefore flawed, so of course we're going to eat the apple. Growing up in a family in which movies, drink, and cursing were forbidden, it was inevitable that I'd become a movie maker who loves his cocktails and curses like a longshoreman. Clearly, it was preordained in the book of Genesis. My parents broke the movie rule a couple of times. The rules of forbidden behavior were dictated by my father's job at an evangelical college rather than his own private beliefs. On one occasion, he and my mother packed my brother and me in the car and drove to the drive-in theater in Ventura to see Winchester 73, a western about the invention of a rifle that changed the West. Directed by Anthony Mann and starring James Stewart, the movie has become something of a classic, though I remember little as a five-year-old other than how cold it was in the car and that we were sneaking around on God by driving to another town to watch it. That was more exciting than the movie. Another time in Whittier, where my mother's parents lived, and the rules were looser, they were English and not evangelical, we went to see Here Come the Nelsons, an Ozzie and Harriet feature about a girdle salesman. When you see very few movies, the details remain vivid. The climactic scene has a dozen girdles tied together between two trees across a road, and the crooks escaping in a car can't break through the girdles. I loved it. The third movie I saw was in Taft, California, a tough oil town 37 miles southwest of Bakersfield. It was my father's hometown, and my brother and I were staying with my grandparents when my grandmother took us to see a movie based on a bestseller about a preacher, a man called Peter. This book was wildly popular in the evangelical world and had been read by everyone in every church I attended as a kid. This was also the only time my rock rib Baptist grandmother had ever been in a movie theater, though we suspected later that year she went to see Oklahoma. They were from West Texas, and Oklahoma was close enough, but was afraid to confess it. So my brother and I sat in the theater watching this weeper, the preacher dies, and when it was over, we all sat for the second feature because it was unthinkable to pay for two movies and not sit through both. On came Ma and Pa Kettle in Waikiki. The title sequence had hula girls, and my grandmother was mortified that she'd ruined us. She covered our eyes and ushered us out of the theater into the searing taft sun. At ten years old, I had glimpsed the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the hula girls looked pretty good even if viewed in grainy shots of a tourist luau circa 1955. The illicitness of the darkened theater and a deep red curtain drawn to reveal larger-than-life images accompanied by an orchestral score was overpowering. Even if the images were Ozzie and Harriet stretching girdles across a road and the good Reverend Peter Marshall expiring too young. We didn't get a television until I was twelve, and that family purchase was triggered not by the desire to see the shows everyone was talking about, Superman and Perry Mason and Alfred Hitchcock Presents, among others, but because of baseball. Eddie Matthews was the star third baseman of the Milwaukee Braves, but, more important, he was our hometown hero from Santa Barbara, and the Braves were in the World Series. This is more than anecdotal history. It's the first great moral crisis I saw my parents confront. The Braves were down two games to one, with a critical fourth game landing on a Sunday in Milwaukee, late morning on the West Coast. The first three games we listened to on the radio. To stay alive, the Braves had to win on Sunday, but we had to be at the First Baptist Church at the same time. After Sunday school, when we trudged upstairs in our scratchy wool slacks and clip-on ties, to the weekly interminable 11 o'clock service where the Reverend Gus Gableman 
the least charismatic Baptist preacher in history, would drone on in a deathless monotone. Something happened as startling as the events that overtook Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. My father swept us boys up and rushed us to our big dented Bjork station wagon. 